Hello and welcome to my live stream. I'm really hoping that some of you can uh, can hear me and that some of you can see me um, and that I've set everything up properly. Um, I've got a little screen behind me that I'll be able to monitor the chat on so if there really are any technical problems give me a shout. It's just me here. Um, the family have gone out for a walk. I hope to watch me at, you know, in the woods as they stroll through the lovely warm sunshine. Right, um, let's see. Uh, come over to the lathe and here we go. I'm going to be starting off with a piece of beach. I'm going to show a lot of uh, airbrushing today and what I'm going to be showing mostly is uh, my ribbon platter effect. I'm hoping that David McLernan's watching because he's done some spectacular renditions of this. And look, I can see some quotes coming in saying, yay, let me put my little face cam on there. And, and of course, I put my face camera on and my uh, compressor kicks in and goes all over the top of everything. Right, I mustn't watch the YouTube feed because it's about three 30 seconds behind me. So, uh, yeah, as I was saying, I'm going to be talking about airbrushing, uh, going to build up to this effect, going to look at how I set out my platters, uh, give a little bit of information about turning the back of one, um, do a little bit of that turning, and then move on to the front of one that I've already prepared. But before I start, get quite a few questions about um, airbrushing, and these are the airbrushes, some of them the airbrushes that I have, two general sorts and the sort that I tend to use most of the time because I'm lazy are these ones, siphon fed, siphon fed, suction fed, bottom fed, jar of colour in the bottom, air hose here on a quick connector so that I can change the, um, the connector, change the um, colour that I'm using quickly. Whereas if you have this type of airbrush, the one I think we all think of as what an airbrush should look like with a little cap on the top here, um, you can have one for each colour, but you have to clean them out all the time. And if you've only got one of these and you have to clean the colour out from there, and I find it just slows me down. And I'm, well, if you've been watching my videos, you know, <laughs> patience is not one of my uh, virtues, not a strength of mine. But I do have a few of those um, gravity type uh, airbrushes if, uh, if that's ever needed. But this is what I mostly use, the, um, the suction type. And you're going to see um, that in use quite a bit today. In terms of what I put inside those uh, airbrushes, I generally tend to use stains. And the reason I use stains, a number of reasons, I use a lot of chestnut stains. Um, I love the vibrancy of the colours. I'm not really a one colour person either, so you know, having quite a lot of colours um, on a platter pleases me immensely. Um, I've got some intrinsic colours as well, and I've used those uh, in airbrushes as too. Um, but I haven't got a set of airbrushes for those colours yet but I do have a set of colours for the chestnut ones, which we'll be using a little later on. Uh, here they are. Here's one of them anyway. So uh, you can see they are very well loved. Um, perhaps, um, <laughs> perhaps some of them could do with a little bit of tender loving care. But the reason I use the spirit stains or stains is one, they're thin already so um, I don't have to thin them down. They work absolutely fine straight in the airbrush to begin with. Dust is a wonderful um, companion in the wood turning world. Dust and paint, well, texture, sludge, uh, yeah, can go with that from time to time. Uh, but stains don't mind the dust. So that's another reason for using stains. The stain will soak into the wood and the dust will just uh, dry on the top and, and then disappear. Right, now I've got a uh, probably far more technology lined up here than I actually need to have. Um, but I'm going to show a little bit of turning um, and going to try also to include um, a little bit of teacherly instruction 
in, well, really, what you're, what you're here for is to see what I do, but what I'm here is to see how much technology I can make work for me. Uh, so we're going to get started on uh, this blank here. So let's put an overhead camera on so that you can see the shaping. Um, I'm going to be using a 3.8 spindle gouge with a uh, long grind not hugely sharply in focus but I have freshly sharpened it um, but even if it were super sharp um, super sharp focus I mean then I'm not sure how much you'd actually see anyway now I am going to be trying to wear or well, wear as much PPE as possible so face face shield um, you might have noticed I had this turned on in the top right hand corner um, a little vapor mask which we'll get to when um, I get on to um, airbrushing right so the sound might go a little bit funny um, I've just seen a question up there any bad brand of airbrush yep I use uh, cheap and cheerful ones um, all sorts of different name brands that I've never heard of but the majority of the ones that I use are from Sealy. Uh, a set that I bought, I saw Les Thorne demonstrating and he used a set of them. Six uh, for, it varies in price from about £70 to £250 available on eBay. I can, I can do some links later on. If I can't get to all of your questions during the, um, the live part of today, I'll get to them later and maybe I'll put a blog or something up answering the questions and, uh, and, and post a link to it on Facebook. Right, so uh, here's my bit of beach. Now, normally I just mount them between centers and uh, get a foot, which I then put in the chuck, but um, my tail stock has come off the lathe today, so I can put a, a rack of iPads um, on there with all sorts of controls for the, for the stream running on them. Um, so I've actually got this on a screw chuck. Now, um, this is a 12 by two inch bit of beach. Um, I'm going to roughly turn a shape at the bottom and show you how I mount it. Um, I'm going, I use a recess. I only use recesses really on shallow platters. And when I first made a recess, it was about 15 millimeters deep and I gradually got um, shallower and shallower with my recesses. So let's get a bit of turning on. If the sound gets a bit too noisy, um, then, uh, then someone type in capitals on the, on the chat so I can see it. Hello, Anthony. Yes, I do remember you from the NEC and glad you love the music. There might even be a little bit playing later if I have to go for a break. Right, so, um, lot, got the lathe speed turned down low. I've got my face shield on. I'm going to put it down in a moment. So if the sound has gone funny now, you need to let me know. Now I'm just pulling up the face. I'm using a draw cut. Looking more like a, a 78 record at the moment with all the grooves that I've got in there. But I'm not worried about them. This is just to get the piece a bit better balanced. Now coming to the edge, I tend to go across at 45 degrees or so to put um, a corner on. And uh, rather than just running across across there at 90 degrees, because it just it doesn't like cutting the grain that way. And this is just about reducing some of the bulk. I think I'm probably shouting. And I'm not going to turn this to a finish, because Sunday afternoon, lovely evening out there. We've got things that we probably all want to do apart from watching me.
Now another person who's done um, some lovely work with the, the technique I'm going to look at, you know, putting the 3D shading of the ribbons on, is a guy called Stuart. What a great name. Stuart Clark. Uh, if you can find him on Facebook. He did a very nice design, which I, I must try, but I haven't done so yet. Okay, so I've got the piece in a uh, much better balance now. I'm going to come back and talk a bit about uh, making my foot, which is where I get to use one of my gizmos. So, um, let's see. Let's put the face camera on so you can see me struggling doing this. Oh, my face camera appears to have frozen. Get rid of that one then. Okay, um, right. So... Here is my attempt to use a, a whiteboard on an iPad. So this is the blank. Um, if we're looking down on it, oh, it almost fits up. So I'm going to put a recess, a dovetailed recess in there. Uh, the size of the recess is going to be 69 millimeters exactly. <laughs> That's the optimum size for um, sea jaws on a chuck. But, um, I know people are a bit wary of recesses and think, well, I've got to make it deep so it's solid. I am going to have a foot on my bowl, just a shallow foot. And all I need to do with my recess is just make sure that it's a bit deeper than the, than the foot goes in. So this distance here comes along and it hits about the middle of my my recess and the reason for that is that if the recess and the foot were the same depth you're probably seeing the problem the problem is you've got a very small area here that arrow is rubbish oh, I need to be back in a classroom doing this daily I don't think I'm gonna make it any better right so get rid of that little symbol so because the recess goes deeper than the foot does I've got a lot more um, behind it to support it rather and it shouldn't shear off now on the screen that looks very deep I've drawn it very deep but my my recesses probably now a day is probably end up roughly about three millimeters um, and at first yes I was a little wary about doing one that size I have to stress I only do this with shallow platters. It's not something I do with um, with large bowls. So I'm going to show you how I make that uh, part and put a bit of shaping on the bottom and then get on to the fun part, which is the other side, of course. Right. So um, what have I lost? I've lost my face camera. Mm, never mind. So let's go back to looking at that with the overhead camera and get rid of the diagram. Right, 69 millimetres. I'm going to use a parting tool. Just going to pull the uh, tool rest back a little bit to allow me to rest the parting tool on it. And I don't measure it, I just sort of guess it. I don't know whether it's a little game I play with myself, but let's see. At the moment, that is 64 and a half millimeters. So nearly there. Use the parting tool just to get a bit more out. Just run it along and make a wide groove. I'm going to go in with a small skew chisel to put the dovetail part on. Right, and then I put my foot. Now that's probably a about an inch and I don't want to go in as deep as I've made my foot so going back to our little diagram the recess here is deeper than the foot is going to be so that when the jaws bite into that recess they've got much more uh, behind them it's uh, turning rather nastily at the moment I haven't got it on very fast speed but Maybe I can put the speed up and get a bit of a better cut going. A 
Now, another thing I do with the foot is I want to uh, angle it in, undercut it. And that does take away a little bit of the depth of the recess, which is, if it becomes a problem, then I'll just um, come back and make it a little bit deeper. So let's get the dovetail part put on now. So I've got a little sharp skew chisel. I want to get my tool rest up above centre. Okay, so just going in, just a mere smidgen. I'm just watching that line go down until it's to the same depth as the rest of the surface. Now, live, you've seen me, I've not measured anything. I think I'm a little large. I think I'm about 71. Uh, oh, well, well, yeah, maybe just 71. That'll do. Right, now, the rest of the shaping, there's a lovely ugly bit in the middle, which we'll get rid of at another stage, is to put a bit of an OG shape in. So I'm just going to work on reducing some of the waste at this edge first. And ideally, I want a curve that starts from the foot, even if it's very shallow. And that's what I'm aiming for now, doing it with pull cuts. Because, oh, well, the first time I had a go with a long ground bowl gouge, I loved the feeling doing a pull cut gave me, so I've carried on doing the, quite a lot of them. Now, it's wobbling around a little. Let's slow it down and let's have a look a bit clearer at the overhead camera. Oh, I don't know why it's got that board on there. Turn that off. Um, so I'm starting to get the shape in. Foot's there. I've still got a bit here that I need to, um, to work down. And um, Once I've got the, that curve established, then I can work on this bit here and get the return curve. Sometimes on this part here, I will, um, I will put a little bit of decoration. So sometimes I leave that a little bit lower. Right, I'm going to have to stop the lathe and reposition my tool rest. It's a little bit high. To allow me to swing round a little more. Okay. So now on the outside, just little nibbles. I've done some platters without this OG shape. But what I like about it is the lift it gives the platter when it's on the table. And it makes it easy to pick it up as well. Now, when you're doing the shaping of this, it's very easy to end up with this being a diagonal rather than a curve. So you need to keep checking. And the other thing that's important is to establish where this rim is because, uh, let's put it on the overhead, you might be able to see it does vary in thickness because it wasn't a perfectly parallel piece of wood. So before I get too carried away with the shaping there and it gets a bit thin at the edge here, I'm just going to finish this edge off. Now I always put that edge, always, uh, not always, sometimes I experiment and do it the other way, but usually i have it at an angle rather than being at 90 degrees to the surface whatever it's going to sit on because i just think it makes it look more interesting okay check that that's still we've still got some wax here so I, I haven't gone far enough yet so let's carry on with that just looking at comments 
Yeah, good. No one seems to be minding the sound. I must be getting that bit right. Good. So, here we go. Turn it up a bit, get past that vibration. That's a bit better. Now, if I have to disappear in the middle, if anyone hears the doorbell ring, let me know, because I'm expecting an Amazon package soon. Oh, right. Now, the other thing I like to do, if I'm not playing it by chance, is just to, mm, let me do this properly, get it that right way position, just to come in and remove a little bit from this side so that I can establish that rim thickness. A little bit awkward getting in. I'm a little bit high, I think. Let's have a look. Okay, so there's my rim thickness. So now I can come back and sort out the shaping. And then nearly nearly done with the bag so I want a continuous curve I don't want any flat bits and I don't want a line here I want a curve so as I'm coming in I'm changing the angle of my body swinging round and although it looks a little bit rough and ready at the moment more delicate cut, pushing my hips round. I knew those south classes my wife made me take would come in useful. Now it's always worth coming and eyeballing it from here because I now can see I've got a nice curve there, I've got a nice great big ridge there, so I need to work on that transition. And going to do that, I, I find I get more success with using a shear cut and getting the tool rest in the right position also helps it was a little bit high there we go let's try that Okay, coming round. Now, it's a little fatter here than I'd like it. So I want to get that curve going more. And that's what's nice about using this type of cut. That because I'm watching across here, I can see the shape of it and where there are little ridges. Now... I'm sure when we all started turning, we watched the tool tip, despite being told what you need to look at is the horizon. Not the horizon, but the horizon of the bowl. And that's where you can see the shape coming in. Okay, let's turn it off and let's have a little look. Yeah, I'm pretty pleased with that shape overall. What I would then do is come in here and tidy out the middle a little bit. Let's see if you can see this. So just taking out what was left behind. Sometimes I leave this a little bit proud and decorate it as a little feature. I think what I really need to do, my other lathe is lovely Vic Mark, lovely solid, wonderful machine, but I haven't got, I've got it in the other bit of the workshop, which is not so easy to use with lots of cameras around. So I think it, I think I might need to have a little rearrange of things. Now, that's the technique and the joy of uh, low quality uh, 
videos, you can't see all the tool marks on it, which is great. Now I would sand that, but you didn't come here to watch sanding. Um, I have one over here, which I have already sanded to 320 and then finished with some chestnut cut and polish. Um, and then we've got the face on this side to do some work on. So that will be sanded. Um, usually I stop at about 240. Um, sometimes I go a bit further than that. But what, once you've got uh, a, a wax finish on the, on the back as well, it, it feels very pleasing to touch. So I will come back and I will um, remove those tool marks and sanding marks at a later stage without you having to watch and hear the ear piercing sound of my dust extractor although there will have to be some sanding on the face of the next bit now rim design i don't like to have a flat rim i either want to have it slanting in or curved and again that just makes things look a little bit more interesting to me and the reason that I finished the back off, you can see there the shine of it, is that when I'm putting stain on, if it gets on the back, the wax makes it a little bit easier to, to rem remove any of that stain, even if it needs to be sanded. Whereas if it's bare wood, it does get sucked in. And uh, sometimes you end up colouring the whole of the back of the bowl as well. Okay. So <sighs> you can see I've nibbled away at the edge here um, I think we can go in a little bit closer uh, and I'm just going to turn across the face get it smooth and then establish a rim and then delve into the dark mysteries of airbrushing just having a quick look at the questions uh, nothing popping up there I don't think uh, no good what we'll do is once I've done the front of this and sanded, I'll have a little little break for questions that you can type in. Right, here we go. This is a piece of very dry, rather dusty beach. I love this, the grind on this tool, it just takes so much away. Okay, I need to just... Rain in my enthusiasm for cutting wood off. Now always leave a lump in the middle to keep the piece stable. Now, depending on the technique that I would be using um, for colouring, I would often leave that standing a bit proud. But the, the technique we're going to do, 3D ribbons, it's easier actually, I found, if I get a flat surface running across. So um, I'm going to do that, even though it means I might have to do a little bit more sanding. It's going to come up a little bit. Not lifting the handle enough, that's better. And again, not lifting the handle enough. There 
There we go, nearly done. It's a rather strange experience doing this live in this way without any sort of easy way of hearing feedback. Right. Now, you need to start getting rid of those tool marks. It is a little bit ridgy. I'm going to drop my tool rest. Now, I don't need to worry too much about the center part here, uh, but I do want. Mm, there's a pencil, there's a pencil. I think this effect works well with quite a wide rim. So I do want this much at least uh, in very nice condition without having to do lots and lots of sanding. So just taking off those high points and making sure I'm putting a little bit of a slope on that rim, just to lead the eye in a bit. I should probably sharpen up my gouge. Let's see how we've done. Not too bad, there are a few tool marks. There's a bit of tear out there. Seems to be a little, can you see if I put that up? Just a little bit, it's a little bit of tear out there. Just do one more. One more was enough. Nearly. Not too bad there. Okay. I'm going to mute the mic for a couple of minutes while I sand that and have the extractor running. Um, and then I'll pause and we get a, a few questions in. Oh, Costas, you can't hear me, but I send you greetings. I'm, I'm glad you like my beard. Elspeth said that I should go and live with you if if you like my beard, which I think tells us what she thinks about my beard. Okay, sanding, health and safety, sanding mask. Go on. I'm not sure how that's going to work with the microphone, but I'm muting the mic now and I'll be back in a couple of minutes or so.
Right, so here we are. That's not the world's greatest bit of sanding, but we haven't come here to watch sanding, have we? I'm just going to open the door, let a bit of fresh air in and uh, the dust out. Well, hopefully let some of the dust out. And I'm going to just have a little pause now while I uh, wait for the air to clear a little. And uh, if you've got any questions, then um, now's the time to ask them. Um, in that, any of that preparation before we get on and have a go uh, with the airbrushes. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get my broken camera working, um, which is a bit annoying. But anyway, it's nice to see 151 of you watching. That's fantastic. Thank you. Some very nice comments coming through. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm glad you could could join. Um, I've managed to cover my bench and all my carefully laid out equipment with shavings, which is perfect. So, uh, any questions? Could the ribbon technique be used on the outside of a deep bowl? Absolutely, it could. And the reason you haven't seen one of those is that I haven't, um, oh, that glove's not going to be any good. Uh, haven't got round to having a go at that myself. Um, but yes, it's a, something that I would really like to try on the outside of a deep bowl or a vase shape. Um, once you've got your head round the rather strange way of producing the 3D effect by, you start at the top and work your way down, um, it can be applied to to uh, any any surface. So, uh, let's have a quick look. Any other questions? Uh, something about sanding. Uh, who's there? Oh, Martin just joined us. Hello, Martin and Steve. Hello, Steve. Oh, hi, David. I see you're here. I hope you were here to hear me mention your name earlier. You've done some lovely ribbon effects. Uh, Am I selling any equipment things I'm not using? Noel Murphy. Am I selling anything, Noel? Uh, charm, charisma. Um, maybe this lathe I'm using if I move my Wivermac one up here. You run out of razor, Stuart. Do you want me to send you one? Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm sure my wife does, but I'm quite happy without... Uh, having to shave so often at the moment. Right, now then, I carefully put down some examples of stencils and things that I'm going to be using. Here they are. Right, so just a quick check. Um, uh, who, any other questions apart from Noel, who I think wants to buy my lathe? Keep dreaming. Stencils, templates, and masks. When I started, I did a lot with uh, a template, which is a bit of like this. You get some nice kind of effects with this, which I can show another time. Uh, stencils, something with a shape that you spray through. Router mat, you get some great effects with that. I then did something with hot melt glue and managed to get all of the hot melt glue off in one go from a rim and I use this quite often for uh, as a stencil and then of course I had to go and buy things and this is probably my most used stencil at the moment a crackle one um, if you've watched the only time I've ever done another live stream was just on a whim one Sunday afternoon actually a couple of years or so ago in a peacock bowl you can see the colors and I used the inside and outside of these these stencil shapes but airbrushing is something that you can get into um, it's another slope I'm sure we're all familiar with that expression there are a few things to talk about with um, airbrushing you are atomizing liquid it is not good to breathe you will need a mask and it's not a dust mask the mask I use is uh, this one, which is an uh, ellipse. I also use their dust mask as well, but I think these filters do dust and vapour. Um, and I, I, I wear this, particularly um, with spraying the spirit stains, but also 
if I'm going to be spraying um, the intrinsic colours as well, then I would wear a vapour mask. Um, it is going to be tricky to wear a vapour mask today. Um, so uh, I've got my doors open, I've got a little fan which I'll turn on and uh, I just have to hope that that will move the fumes uh, away enough. If I notice that it isn't moving the fumes away enough then I'm going to have to put the mask on. Right, so uh, here is my box of toys. Um, I'll just reposition that camera a little bit, I hope it doesn't cut out. No, good. So I've got one for each of the main colours uh, that, I, that I use. And if there's a interest enough in airbrushing, when uh, I've got to the end of this one, uh, then maybe we'll look at airbrushing some other things. Now, compressor. You need a compressor for an airbrush. I've got uh, a rather loud, noisy one. Uh, thank you very much. And I also have this little, little compressor here, which I bought off Amazon which doesn't have a tank, it's just a pump, and I use this for demos. Uh, if you're going to be set up, it's probably better to have one with an air tank on um, as well, because that helps um, the pump isn't running all the time. And this pump isn't really rated for doing hours and hours of airbrushing, but it only gets used in short bursts, you know, 10 or 15 minutes here or there, and it's absolutely fine for that. Um, so, um, like I say, if you've got questions about airbrushes, if I can't answer them today, I'll look back and read the comments and, and put a post up with that information on. Um, for the compressor I'm going to use, that I use when I do my videos, is under the lathe. It's very noisy when it gets uh, it's pumping, but um, that's the one I've got set up, so I'll just turn that on now. <laughs> Now, the joy of doing this from my workshop is I don't have to bring all this stuff with me. I have quick connectors uh, for the airbrushes because I want to change them quickly. I'm impatient, as I've already alluded to. And that just clicks on there, clicks off, and then you, you've changed colour as quickly as that. Now, people will tell you that if you use this kind of uh, cheap airbrush, there are seals in here that aren't made from the best type of material and that they might become um, corroded. I've been using these airbrushes for over two years now and I haven't had a problem with the seals, um, but I may be lucky. And I generally tend to keep the stains plugged into them as well. Occasionally I need to give them a clean out with some either meths or cellulose uh, uh, lacquer. Not cellulose lacquer, what's it called? Uh, cellulose thinners that's what it's called uh, which oh, smells very noxious right now I'm looking here I can see I've got swirl marks which are going to add some other interesting texture we're going to start off the airbrush is what's called a dual action and it should be that you press the trigger down and you just get air coming out and you pull it back and then you get color now some of the brushes that I use, that doesn't quite work and I get a bit of colour coming out even when I haven't pulled the trigger back and maybe that's a sign of seals going. But I'm not doing art with these, I'm, I'm spraying with these so... Um, and they do what I want them to do but uh, I do have a more expensive gravity fed airbrush which I haven't used yet but maybe another time. It's useful to keep the middle as well so that you can see how the colour's going on. Uh, which is absolutely fine so just want to put a base color down now I said this is about working backwards so what we're seeing I'm putting the top color on first um, just might turn that screen around I've got a little screen up there I don't want it to be yellow now the base coat I could have just wiped on actually with a bit of paper towel but that's in such short supply. Okay, so there we go, that's the first colour put on. Um, 
the top layer of the illusion is the lightest layer but uh, I don't want it just to be plain um, if you watched um, the uh, what's the word evolution of this idea then uh, you know here's an example of the first my first go at this and um, you can see that it's just plain colors I sprayed yellow put masking tape on sprayed orange put shadow in put tape on sprayed red put shadow on and gradually work my way down and you can see that uh, that three-dimensional look now I uh, probably should work out a more interesting design what I liked about one of the ones that David did was that he did short lengths of um, of masking tape and that looked very effective in fact it's featured a couple of times on the Hampshire Sheen page on Facebook as an sample of work with their colors then I like to have a bit more texture in the color as well so oh I get to use stencils so this is a uh, uh, the, the second evolution of the idea and perhaps you've all seen that those videos anyway and it ended up with me thinking well I want to do something curvy and this is my curvy effort with very thin curving tape which was great fun to do except I completely forgot to um, to take any still images of it oh well okay so uh, that's had a few moments to dry it doesn't need very long to dry uh, putting the stencil on going over it with black now and not worrying about being too neat but trying to use a little bit of the using all of the stencil what I want to avoid and I'm going to do it so that you see how disastrous it is is to spray there and get that straight line and you think oh god I've ruined it well you might be able to get away with that my motto is if it goes wrong you just carry on <laughs> and uh, turn it into something else so this is fun Sunday afternoon and you're watching watching stain dry unless you're my family have gone out for a walk in the woods what do I got to do to get them to watch a bit of wood turning do I have to pay them uh, and it's easy to get completely carried away with with spraying have a quick look at the questions uh, no good nothing on there everyone happy I hope right so that's the the first layer done and this is where you want to start buying your shares in masking tape you can reuse it if you're careful um, I'm not going to give an awful lot of thought to the design just to illustrate a principle that's really what my I feel my videos are not you know I don't want you to go and say right I'm going to do that one because that's what Stuart did it's not like I'm, I've come up with a beautiful bowl design like um, Nick Agar's Viking Sunset the most famous bowl in the world according to Les Thorne that is but uh, it just demonstrates the idea because I think a few people even in the video I posted on this were still a, perhaps a bit confused by it mm, I think I'm going to do one more along here and if I were patient and more uh, interested in developing an idea the next stage for this in terms of how it would evolve as an idea would be to have the effect that it was woven with the 3d effect on now I want to make sure that those edges are down firmly and then I'm going to move on to the second layer so if we go back to uh, our slideshow I can zoom in into that so the second layer in this image is is the orange now we just, I just need to be something darker uh, it does give me an opportunity to use my favorite color combination of yellow red yellow orange red and black but um, that's just by the by so I'm going to put a darker layer on now turn that uh, la, 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 la. turn that off so on with the orange and so you can see how easy it is I just get one airbrush unplug it put another one on 
and I want to just darken down that area and it doesn't matter if it's not completely darkened down can even take the stencil again and even though it's the same colour it will still um, stand out because you're putting oh that's the joy of live broadcasting folks and the joy of a very noisy compressor because even though uh, it's the same colour the stains will build up in intensity and that's something I like I like doing building up uh, different layers of colour and depths of colour. Right, still not quite dark enough. This is a new stencil, fresh from the packet that my son and his partner got me for Christmas. Thank you, Joe and Gabs. So I'm going to have a go with that. Oh, that's interesting. Rather pleasant. Pleasant. Such an insipid word of praise, isn't it? Now you'll notice, because this is a new stencil, you can see it, it does get rather covered with uh, stain and you will need to clean them every so often. Uh, one way of cleaning them is to have on the bed of your lathe a board protecting it from being covered with stain and just patting it and that will remove quite a bit of the stain. I should have protected my lathe bed. I forgot all about that in the excitement of appearing live. Right, so that's looking reasonably darker, but I just want to go in and where there's a bits of quite strong yellow, just tone those down a little bit. Right, so that's enough for the orange. So we've got our first layer under this masking tape. We've now got the second layer of colour. So I'm going to put some masking tape on that. Now what I liked about Stuart Clark's um, take on this was he did squares diminishing in size as you went went in and I thought that looked really effective. I still haven't had a go myself although I wanted to. Maybe let's do it. Let me let's do a triangle for this one. And you can see it does use quite a bit of tape up. That's not going to be a brilliant bit of 3D effect over here, but I'll leave it to the uh, geometrists to work out a better layout. I've forgotten something, didn't I? I didn't put the shadows in. Ah, oh, that's annoying. Start again. See, even I get confused with this wonderful technique. Right, shadows. Uh, do the shadows with black. And the shadows are just practice in the middle just running faintly along the intersection of the tape and the color below now I'm speeding along but this is just demonstrating the, the principle and it's naturally gives an a harder line against the tape than against the outside. What I don't want is a bit of a gap there. Oh, gone wrong. Far too, far too thick there. Right, now we've done, so we've done the second layer of colour, we've done the first line of shadows, now we can get on with layer three. How are we doing for tiles? Five, five to six. I'm hoping to be done with this in about 10 minutes time. I think I'm going to do them going across slightly different design, a bit more interesting rather than having them running parallel with each other. Oh, sticking to the gloves. There we go. Who else haven't I said hello to? Oh, Chestnut Products. Hello. Hi, Terry. 
Oh, and John. Oh, and there we go. Yes, Stuart, there you are. Hello. I've been dropping your name lightly. Right. Now, next layer of colour. Going to make it a bit darker. Moving on to uh, red. Where's my air hose gone? There it is. Okay, so darkening it down more. And to uh, give us that illusion of depth. And I'm also going to come back and do a little bit more um, of the stencil. That's a way of getting it darker, but having it not having it so, as, as a black, a solid colour. You can see I've got a little bit of a transfer from the stencil. I'm not too bothered. I'm going a bit fast, but I don't want to bore anyone. Now somewhere under here is the bit where we went over the edge of the stencil. I wonder if we'll be able to spot it at the end. Just come around here. Now one thing you can do is that obviously if the stencil's flat on the surface, you get crisp edges. If you move it away from the edge, you get, and let's do it over on this bit here, you get a much sort of f f hazier, softer focused version of the stencil. Right, that's that bit done. I really am going to have to clean my lathe bed up after this. It's, but it cleans off very easily with with uh, with meths. Now I've got shadows on these lines, but I haven't got shadows on the lines that I've put on now. So that's the next stage. And this is a, an exercise in in faith, really, because it's so much is covered up, and it looks like such a are you allowed to say dog's dinner for something messy? You just have to believe that when all the tape comes off, something better looking is going to appear. Right, now, I want to try and get these contrasting directions again with the previous layer. This is the third layer. I think we'll make this the last one. And, uh... Clean the bloody what, someone? Clean the blood off the lathe bed, Stuart. If only it were blood, that would be a bit more honourable than just spilt stain, wouldn't it? Poor lathe. It'll, uh, that knocks a tenner off the price, Noel, if you're interested. Ah! Let's see, let's get that going. Over that one. Ah. And... Maybe over there. And maybe even... The problem is it does stick to gloves sometimes, masking tape. Let's go across there. Is there room for one more? Oh, I think I might get one in there. And maybe even a hint of one across the side there. What I don't want is the tape to touch itself. Um, I don't know why. Maybe I'll do one with tape touching itself one day and see what that's like. Now some of it has lifted a bit. It is good to make sure you've got your edges stuck down and obviously make sure you remember to do your shadows before you put your tape on for the next layer. So we're going to the uh, fourth layer which needs a, something a bit darker still so I think I'll treat myself to a little bit of purple right and in the gaps now this is where sometimes on this layer I use a different color tape because it does start to get everything's a bit colored um, and it can be confusing to know which ones you're going to put the shadows on. Not that it matters, but if you are worried about, about that, you can 
mark them with a dot so that you know oh those are the ones that definitely need the shadows for this next layer although it is quite a bit darker and it's sometimes quite hard to spot them looks a pig's ear maybe thank you john a pig's ear rather than a dog's dinner yeah, that's a good one right now this there are little areas where you're still seeing a bit of color i don't want to completely fill those with the stain so that it hints at something lower down and although this middle bit is all going to be cut away it's easier sometimes just to carry across it. Oh, that one was a bit heavy handed. Maybe better quality airbrushes have, it's a bit easier to control the trigger. I'll find out when I use my better quality one eventually. It's running along that edge. Okay, I think, oh, have I done them all? I think so. Oh, doesn't it look horrible? Right, just going to give that a moment or two to um, to dry off. Just make her uh, clear up a little bit. So a little pause. If you've got any questions about the airbrushing, then pop them up now and I'll answer them if someone else hasn't already done so. The, the stain uh, is dry on there now but I wouldn't put any um, sealer on it yet I'll talk about finishing it in a little bit maybe if you normally allow time for each colour to dry they will be dry already yeah uh, they're dry already on the wood sometimes the masking tape they stay a little bit wetter a bit longer because they're not soaking into it um, let's just clean the blood off the lathe Cool, look at that. Just like that. And it's gone. Oh, and so am I. That's very fumy. Oh, is fumy a word? I don't know how many non-words I've slipped in today, Noel. I meant to do more of them just to annoy you. Right, any questions? Dry already, turned. You always start with a brighter colour first and finish with the darker colour last, says Jack. Yes, I do. And and the reason for that, if I, if, uh, I put the slide back up, and zoom in on it uh, so we started at the top um, clear that board off clear go away right so this was the first color that was put on um, the yellow and that was on all of the, all of the rim but then that's covered up and then we move on to the second layer that orange layer and then that gets covered up with the masking tape and the shadows put on and then that layer number three and on this one I was even more adventurous with a with a fourth layer uh, underneath there and then layer five was just what was left um, when the last layer of shadows were put on if you started with the darker color first and covered it up um, it would be back to front and you wouldn't be able to get the lighter colors to show on top of the um, darker colors obviously you you would be able to do that if you were using paints um, but uh, I wasn't using paints any other questions when you use the red stain you really think it's blood <laughs> um, not really uh, let me see Hardener and Steambag are fantastic airbrushes to use. Maybe one day. I mean, this year I was so excited. I had a lot of demonstrations lined up. I thought I'm going to be able to buy a whole load of exciting and wonderful kit. In fact, I went out and bought some exciting, wonderful kit before I'd even earned all of the money I was going to um, earn this year. And then we all know what happened. Now... This is just ordinary masking tape. You can splash out and buy uh, expensive tape if you want. 
Just seeing if any more questions. Would you be allowing this piece to survive, Stuart, or turning it off? Oh, Steve, you know me so well. Well, the fact I put so much effort into turning the back should suggest that I should keep it. Although, um, I don't know if you can see, I have got quite a lot of uh, damage on the back, much more so than normal. It's the exuberance of being live and trying to keep you entertained. Normally when I'm here on my own doing it, it's rather slow and pedestrian and dull and boring. Um, probably, probably be a keeper. But we'll have to see when all the tape comes off. And I'm, can you see I'm doing a, a, a slow reveal rather than pulling little bits of tape off, trying to get a dramatic wow moment. It happened once in one demonstration. Um, right at the very end, which is very gratifying. And I thought, oh, that's a great show-stopping piece to end a demonstration with. And when I did it next time, it was rather just sort of mildly, pleasantly, pleasantly received. Pleasantly. Right, now you're on the overhead camera at the moment, so you're not seeing this is in, in exciting a way as it could be seen. So let's, uh, let's do that and turn off the slideshow. Oh, now there's now it's art at the moment, isn't it? With with the paper flapping around in the breeze like that. Now, of course, colours are completely down to you. As long as if you're doing it with stains, that you work from lighter to darker. And having looked at the uh, slideshow images of the first effort with the plane, oh, well, that's a bit that's a bit dull, isn't it? might need to do something about that. I'm hoping that it will um, it's make this look a bit more interesting with the extra colours that have been added. Now to my eye I think that's a bit bit too boring. What I what I might do one day is try uh, just masking off different areas and leaving chunks of it but people get a bit annoyed if I keep putting lots and lots of colour on. My mother-in-law liked the last one I did because I thought it was lovely, she said, because you didn't put so much colours on. Sometimes you just put too much on. Well, it must be a personality defect or trait. So we've got the 3D effect for sure. Best bits for that in that uh, junction there of those three different layers. Here, maybe the shadow could have been a bit stronger on that on that layer and although it looks a bit messy oh wow thank you very much a don't Paul that's very very generous thank you oh I could buy a new airbrush um, wow that's taking my breath away thank you no stop not I don't know what to say right move on it looks a mess until you turn the middle out turning the middle out always makes a difference and it also is a wonderful opportunity to put some extra texture in by sliding back across it. And if that does happen today, uh, it will have been done deliberately to show you that all things are transitory and nothing lasts. Whew. Get this at the right sort of height and reasonable speed. Now I'm not going to turn the whole middle out and finish it. Uh, but I think it's important to see the effect of what the colour looks like against the wood. I have done uh, a few platters where I've completely covered them with stain and while I like them I do prefer there to be some wood left the other thing I didn't say about the recess that I turn is that I actually leave the recess in just to annoy wood turners I think I'm a little bit high actually. High again. Yeah, just to annoy wood turners. 
but also it means that when I'm running out of ideas or time to make a video I can just put an old platter on in that recess and give it another treatment and that's one of the things I talk about in the demos that I do is don't be so precious about your wood Now I'm just going to take this down to the bottom of the screw hole. Getting a nice lot of vibration there. Need to sharpen my gouge really. I think I've already said that once today. But that'll do. Uh, ignore the tear out. But that, I think, once you've got the, um... Oh, that is awful. I'm just going to go in and do that a little bit. Once you see the colour against the wood, that's when it really starts to come to life and it adds a, another dimension to it. Now, there we go. That's the, the ribbon effect. So it can be straight, it could be curved, it could be um, a mixture of the two, it could be short, bit short uh, lengths of tape, it could even B, he says, having a quick rummage. Again, another idea I've had but not tried. It could even be circles that you stick on and put shadows around. Um, the choice, the choice, as they say, the choice is yours. What's that? What's that game show? Right, let's just have a quick look at questions. Uh, anyone that have come up? Um, oh yeah, thank you, Roger. Definitely more on. Furini special, absolutely. The more the merrier, the more the better. Um, someone says, I was considering the same as I don't have an airbrush. I don't know what that was in relation to. Um, whether it could be done. You could probably do it with, with brushes um, and do the shadow with dry brushing. Part of the inspiration for the idea came from me watching a man called, I think, John Begley, Beckley, on YouTube, who does a lot of um, uh, abstract art, and saw him. I saw him using masking tape with with a paintbrush and using paintbrush, putting shadow on on squares of of a picture. Um, but let's see, any other questions? Oh, blue tack. <laughs> yes, David, you did a great job of my blue tack uh, idea as well. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Phil. Oh, thank you, Frida. Hello. Where are you? Hello, Frida. Frida's, Frida's a relative. Marvellous. I didn't know she was be, what, be watching. OK, let's uh, let's take it over to the main camera and uh, then can have a chat. I think I'm going to leave it in the chuck. Um, just so you know, I'm going to uh, I'm going to keep it and not turn it off. But while I'm over there on this camera, there you go. The view that you're used to seeing. I don't know if anyone's noticed the lighting's a bit different. I've got. A lot of daylight spotlights and fluorescent tubes over there. Oh, it's been fun. Um, about being precious with wood. Finishing thought for the day. This started off the same thickness as one of the uh, one of the bits, and I just used it to try out ideas. Centrifuges was the last idea. I'd be happy to do some centrifugal demos if anyone's interested in that, or if you want to see how. Um, where did I put it? How irritating using uh, walking around in circles. An airbrush like this is. 
you can have a go at that another time as well. But I've really enjoyed myself. I hope you have too. I hope it hasn't uh, dragged at any point. But I would really like to read through the, all your comments. And uh, if there's any questions that I haven't answered, then I will answer them. Uh, where are we? It's quarter past six now. So um, if you're all right to hang around, I'll hang around for another five or ten minutes looking at the comments and taking any further questions. But for, for now, that's the, the demoing bit done. And uh, I'll just uh, answer any questions. Oh, two property services, definitely on the centrifuge. Well, that's easy. That, that can be done. Oh, yep. Yeah. Dennis would like centrifuge too, no problem. Does it have to be low tack masking tape, full strength sticky? Um, what I used was, um, I think I just bought it online. This is just bog standard, um, just bog standard. Let's put it on that camera. This is just bog standard masking tape. Um, I have got other sorts, if I can remember where I hid the box. Um, one of them, the low tack stuff, sometimes is a bit irritating because you, it's hard to get the edges to stay down. This blue painter's tape, for example, sometimes it sticks, sometimes it doesn't. It is much less tacky than this masking tape, but I've not had problems with the stronger stuff pulling away the colours or, or, or anything like that. So um, just ordinary masking tape works fine. I don't know what brand it is, but the, oh, there we go, it's 3M. I've got some, this is the curvy stuff. Um, some of it very thin, sort of like pinstripe effect, that's made by hmm, 8MM, <laughs> I thought it was 3M for a moment. Something, again, I bought off eBay. Right. Uh, Caitlin the cat, what would I need? What's that connected to, Caitlin? Um, is it to do with airbrushing or... Oh, thank you very much, Tubby Turner. Dave, thank you for that donation. That's very kind of you. Oh, and thanks, Barry. Uh, any more questions? I can't do centrifuge on my live anymore. A lot of people f are getting fed up on me doing it. Okay. So, no, so, but someone else would like a centrifuge piece, John, yep, that's good, because then I get to use my specially designed centrifuge box to, that protects my lathe better than I've protected it today. Uh, do you find the masking tape leaves residue on the piece? No, I don't, no, I had a problem with that. Stuart, you me Sealy for airbrushes, where is the best place to get them? Okay, yeah, the Sealy airbrushes I mentioned, I have got those from, um, from eBay. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put a link later on, but they do vary um, in price. Um, I don't know if they vary in being genuine Sealy or not. I hadn't thought about that. Um, oh, thank you very much, Jason. Oh, yes, and you said I'll talk about finishing. Yeah, I'll talk about that in a moment then. Um, but the airbrushes, if you look for, I think there's Sealy, there is a code A b345 something like that i will find it I'll, I'll put a link and uh you can have a have a look the last time i looked they did have a set on there for about 70 pounds right for finishing um if you look at some of the videos i've done when i put a lot of spirit stain on um i'm just going to try and get a camera so i can look at you or you can look at me there we go where was the yep yeah. so in terms of finishing uh, if it's been a few coats of stain that have just been wiped on and this is the one I showed you at the be at the beginning if if I, I I would always seal it afterwards and the sealer I generally use is um, is of course one I'm not going to be able to put my hand on. I normally use this, the acrylic sanding sealer. I'm just getting caught up in my airline down there. Yeah, I normally use acrylic sanding sealer from Chestnut, sometimes cellulose. If there's been a lot of stain on it, 
and uh, you put the sealer on, it can reactivate it and blend the colours together a little bit, thin them a little bit, sort of almost like a sort of distressed look, which is quite attractive. But if you want to preserve the crispness of the colour, you've got to leave it to dry. And that's where I do have to show patience. So I normally leave it overnight and then I'll put, um, put the sealer on. And then I would normally use a lacquer, gloss or matte, uh, several coats of that and buff it and then wax it. Um, I've done one or two more in the winter when it was a bit colder in the workshop where I, after I put the sealer on, I just used some wax because I was impatient and wanted to shine. <laughs> okay, right, let's see. Any other questions? Derek, you need a haircut. Oh, I need a haircut. Thank you, Derek. Oh, thank you very much, Erin. That's very kind of you. And thank you, Phil. Um, any more questions? Right, so is this a good time slot for people? Do I need to come back and... and oh, do I need to come back and do this again next Sunday? Hmm, maybe. Looks like... Uh, looks like uh, Centrifuge would be popular. Have you used automotive pin strip tape, Harold asks? Uh, I haven't yet, no. Um, I... I really must. There are so many things I have wanted to try. I've just noticed how close I've got in some of those shots. Look how much grey is in my beard. How very distinguished um, I look. I'm, I'm making an effort to stand back. Oh, I can turn off my little mask symbol there now. OK, so a couple more minutes if any further questions. Uh, so I think that question, I've, maybe I've scrolled up too far. I think I've seen those. Damn, was counting the grey then. Thank you very much. As long as it was just on my chin and not, not up my nose. Time is perfect, mate. Yes, yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. More live demos. Cool, you're a demanding crowd. OK. Uh, yeah, well, um, all being well, I'll see you next Sunday. It was kind of neat today, the 17th at 1700. So next week will be the 24th. Oh, I'm not going to do it at midnight. Sorry, America. You'll just have to get up early if you want to see it. Right. Until next time. Thanks for watching. <laughs>